uh, when we planned originally this uh, this general this meeting, uh, we thought we we met and we thought that it would be nice to have something in combination of science and society. So this day is really a good example of this. We'll start with science in the first part of the day, and then we'll pay our duties to society and go and vote and hope for the best. Um, I also wanted to mention very briefly, um, in related to this, uh, to the first session on uh, on quantum uh, on, on quantum mechanics and quantum com quantum computing. Um, there is a body here in Israel called TELEM. It's an acronym in Hebrew for uh, Infrastructure for Research. Um, and it's a body that uh, decides in Israel and funds large-scale project infrastructure, national -wide, nationwide infrastructure projects. Uh, and uh, it combines various ministries of the, uh, of the government and it's a uh, traditionally headed by a member of the Academy of Science, and uh, I'm now fulfilling this role. And it does not fund many things. It's one project every year or two, and the most recent one has been in quantum science and technology, which was approved. It still didn't start yet, but it's about to start uh, this academic year. Um, and it's part of the reflect reflection of the intergoing interest in Israel and worldwide in Obviously, there is the science of quantum mechanics, but also new directions in which now quantum science meets in a very serious ways, uh, technology in quantum computing and in quantum uh, communication that we will hear about, but also other areas such as quantum sensing and quantum materials. Um, and this is our, the first session of this, uh, of this morning is on quantum computing, and the first speaker is Professor Dorit uh, Aronov, and uh, she uh, did her uh, Actually, she did her master's the Weizmann, right? So that's half of it. Okay, it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, and then <clears throat> the PhD at the Hebrew University here in Jerusalem in combining computer science and physics. Uh, did postdoc at Princeton at the Institute and uh, at, at Berkeley. Um, in her fields of, she is the 2006, I, I believe, the Krill uh, Prize. Uh, her field is uh, quantum mechanics and computations, quantum quantum computation, quantum error correction, algorithms and cryptography, and sort of the general fundamental connections between quantum mechanics and computation. So I'll read, please. The title you can see, or you cannot see, I can see it. Quantum computing, uh, a computational lens on quantum, uh, on quantum mechanics. Okay, thank you, Shimon. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, honorable. Um, venue. Um, and thanks a lot for coming uh, so uh, early before morning to, to this session. Um, and um, um, the, the, what I'm going to talk about today is, is, uh, is basically, so there's this question of why now? Why is this such a big fuss about, uh, about quantum computing now, even though we, we, are, we know of quantum computation already for 20 years? Um, or more, 25. Um, so why? What's going on? So um, quantum mechanics is, uh, is more than 100 years old, uh, and it's hard to imagine the 20th century without quantum mechanics and without its implications. So what happened? Um, so my take on this um, is that what happened is actually the reason why we're seeing the second quantum revolution now um, in the form of many, many industry and companies interested and a lot of money invested in quantum computation is not just because um, <coughs> of, I don't know, interest in quantum computation, but it's because of, uh, because concepts from computer science took time to penetrate into physics. And over the past 10 years, um, we're seeing more and more very fundamental concepts from theoretical computer science, complexity, computational complexity, universality, hardness, robustness, interaction, entering into uh, the very study of physical systems, not, in the context, not just in the context of technologically trying to build a quantum computer, but um, they're becoming bricks in, with which people can actually play with um, in the context of, uh, of other, uh, of, of basically manipulations of physical systems and understanding physical systems. And so what I'd like, so okay, all these concepts 
you know, these, these are not new concepts. Physicists and natural sciences have, have their own take on any of these concepts. Um, and they have fundamental and, and very deep things to say about them. But theoretical computer science has its own take on these. And it has a, its own questions and its own uh, possibilities of what it can say and contribute and prove about the, them. And mainly, I think, ask about them in formal ways, which are different than the other sciences. And so uh, I want to actually tell you about some of these concepts, how they penetrated into the study of physics from using concepts from quantum computation, but actually um, aimed at understanding physical systems from the computational lens. So, um, so the first concept to which I devote something like half my talk is, uh, is the notion of computational complexity and, uh, and the notion of what, what it means to compute, some, what is computable in our world, both classically and quantumly. Okay, so starting point is uh, what's a computation? We all know uh, of uh, Turing's seminal work of, uh, of uh, the Turing machine. And I think the, most, the, the thing that makes this uh, uh, Turing model so important is that somehow it captures the, um, let's see if it does work. Does it work? Yes, okay. Uh, somehow it captures this, uh, uh, this notion of computation which is universal. Uh, and which, which is common to essentially any model of computation that one can think of, if one doesn't think about quantum computation, um, which is what are the basic uh, ingredients in this, in this model? Well, uh, you have local um, representation of the information, and then you have local rules and very simple rules that update this information. And from these very simple local rules, you get very high complexity. And so uh, the Turing machine captures this notion that is common to all computational models, including the DNA computer and other models. But more so, it captures the complexity of, of this model in the sense that it uh, uh, can be stated using the extended church Turing thesis. So what does this say? Um, the extended church Turing thesis says that all physically reasonable computational models can be simulated with polynomial overhead by a Turing machine. Um, so that means that this Turing machine model um, captures everything that is computable to within polynomial overhead. So if we look with the right resolution, um, it captures all, all that is computable in our world. And as always, if everything looks the same, it's, uh, we don't really understand what's going on. With the example of quantum computation, it sheds new light on what is computable in this world. Um, quantum computation is the only model that credibly challenges these theses. Okay, so I want to go through something like, uh, uh, I don't know, a few minutes of, of uh, exposition very quickly of what is quantum computation. <coughs> okay, so, okay, we are trying to implement, not we, but some people, are trying to implement quantum computers um, using various physical systems, and uh, this, is, uh, this can be very, very difficult. But the, the nice thing about uh, coming to it from a computational point of view is that we, we can extract the ingredients, uh, the, the abstract information theoretical ingredients from the model and, uh, and actually construct a very simple mathematical model uh, that describes quantum computation. So its first ingredient uh, is a, a qubit, a quantum bit. Um, and uh, we need just two, two uh, principles to describe what's going on with the quantum bit. The first principle is the superposition principle that tells us that you can actually, that a qubit can actually be, or any physical system, can be in a linear combination of all its possible classical configurations. So a qubit can be in a superposition of zero and one, and its state is described by a two-dimensional uh, Hilbert space or vector space. Um, and the basis are zero and one, but we are in some linear combination of those. And, uh, and then the second principle is the measurement principle, which tells us that if we want to actually measure this qubit and ask whether it's zero or one, we can do this, and the process is probabilistic. And the answer, whether it's zero or one, is going to be probabilistic. And then after it's measured and the answer is, say, zero, the state collapses. Um, okay, never mind exactly the, the definition of the model, but the point is that 
these rules seem very counterintuitive. There, are, there have been hundreds and thousands of articles and papers talking about how counterintuitive they are, trying to understand them. But if you take them for granted, um, they lead to a very interesting model, the quantum computation model. So the next step is to take such qubits and put n of them together. Okay, so what, what happens then? If you have n quantum bits, um, well, by the superposition principle, you need to look at all the classical configurations of these bits and take a superposition of them, and, uh, and then that tells you that the state of n quantum bits, say 1,000, is a superposition of all the 2 to the 1,000 possible configurations, uh, which means that the state of just a very small system of 1,000 qubits lives in a vector space whose dimension is larger than the estimated number of particles in the universe. So it's mind-boggling. It's somehow a very small system is described by a humongous description. And this difference between the size of the description and the size of the system, and this difference between classical systems and quantum systems is the first ingredient in what gives quantum computation its power. Okay, so there's the linear uh, growth of the description classically versus the exponential growth quantumly. And this was noticed by Feynman and others, um, and they basically not in exactly in those words, but they looked at, at this difference and they said, well, quantum systems are hard to simulate by classical systems because of these, this exponential difference. So then maybe we can harness uh, uh, the, so then maybe they do something very interesting that we cannot simulate. So maybe we can harness this as computational devices that would do those interesting things. Okay. And, and so in order to actually think what can be done with them, you need to actually talk about uh, the steps of the computation, not just the states, just like in, say, the game of life that was running there be below, or uh, in Turing machine, the local update rules. We need some local update rules also in quantum systems. And the local update rules are quantum gates, which we don't really need to dive into, but quantum mechanics tells us that they're unitary. And uh, they're local, meaning that they change locally particles, um, but their effect on the vector space can be highly non-local. Um, and so the complexity is measured by the number of such uh, local steps. So you will recognize here uh, the knot and the controlled knot, uh, or some classical gates here. But there's also a quantum gate called Hadamard, which is a very special gate because it takes a state, a classical state, to a superposition of two classical states. So it can sort of uh, increase the, uh, the state, the support of the state, so that it is, a, it is in a growing superposition of more and more and more um, strings in the, configure, in, the, in the state. So using the concatenation of such gates, you can actually implement um, and create very complicated states. OK, so now. Um, by the way, it doesn't really matter which gates we're picking here. Almost any choice would, would lead to universal quantum computation and would lead to the same complexity. So if we pick a certain set of gates and versus a different set of gates, the, it doesn't really matter from the point of view of, so one can simulate another with polynomial overhead. So the definition is robust. Um, okay, so, so then the question is, what can we do with this model? And, and uh, and there are, so there are two main, in, main things that we need to rely on when we think what can be done with this model. The first thing is quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement people uh, often think of as, uh, as a, a state called EPR, which is einstein podolsky rosen state, which is um, uh, two qubits entangled in, in this, uh, spook, uh, entangled in this way that can generate what's called spooky action at a distance. Um, but this is not the entanglement we're interested in. We're interested in actually entanglement which is much more complicated and uh, which involves all n qubits and all two to the n states, or most of them, um, multipartite entanglement. And so quantum systems, quantum computers need to explore highly complex states. And then the next ingredient is interference. Interference is what will allow us to make use, in a clever way, these highly entangled states. Um, okay, so let's look again at this Hadamard gate that takes zero to zero plus one, 
and 1 to 0 minus 1. And you can think of this as a probabilistic uh, combination of 0 and 1, except there is this minus sign there, which is hard to explain. Um, but if you ignore this minus sign for a moment, you can think of this as a coin flip, as a quantum coin flip. You generate this, uh, this uh, operation, and then you can measure this state, and you'll get with probability half 0 and with probability half 1. Um, and so it's like a quantum coin flip, except if we now apply the Hadamard twice, it doesn't behave like a classical coin flip, which you apply twice, you just get a random bit. Uh, there are cancellations. So what will happen is that 0 will go to 0 plus 1. You apply this again, by linearity you get 0 plus 1 plus 0 minus 1. 1 and 1 cancel out, and that's destructive interference, and you get deterministic 0. So Basically, you can design such cancellations in clever ways to design quantum algorithms. And this is the phenomenon of destructive interference. And it can also be pictured with uh, what's called Feynman path integrals. Like, uh, so zero contributes some uh, coefficient to zero and to one. One contributes some coefficient to zero and to one. And at the end, the weight on zero, for example, would be the sum of the weights coming from both arrows. And so since the weights could be negative, um, there could be cancellations. And the clever thing about designing quantum algorithms is that now we are talking about um, exponentially many such paths that are designed to cancel or constructively interfere in such a way that the right results or the correct results of certain algorithms would constructively interfere. And that's the secret of designing quantum algorithms, which actually is not known to us. We are still not understanding. I mean, we don't understand how to design quantum algorithms. We have, we have a few examples, very important examples, but we're very far from really understanding what's going on. Um, so the examples are, of course, we've all heard of Shor's algorithm. There are quite a few other interesting examples, uh, like linear equations and, and various questions on graphs and on knots. Um, but, uh, and all, all these examples provide exponential speedups over known classical algorithms. Of course, we don't know that there are no um, uh, better classical algorithms, but um, they provide exponential speedups over what we know. And this gives the evidence that quantum computation indeed is exponentially stronger than classical computers. Okay, so, so the computational map that we're now facing is this. Um, you have this class P and BPP, which we think of as almost the same. Essentially, BPP is the randomized polynomial time computable functions. And BQP is the same if you have a quantum computer. <coughs> okay? Bounded quantum polynomial time. And the, the point is that we strongly believe that these problems that I talked about before lie here and not in BPP. So BQP and BPP are different languages, uh, are different classes. And this is the class which we think is tractable in our, in our world, uh, if we can implement quantum computers. Um, and this is the origin of our belief that quantum computation really violates the extended church Turing thesis. It's actually, it's more subtle than that. There are actually two reasons for that that need to be combined, um, two ingredients for this reason. So here is the extended church Turing thesis, that all physically realizable computational models can be stimulated in polynomial time by a Turing machine. And we actually believe two things. One is a mathematical conjecture, that BQP is strictly larger than BPP. That's just a statement, a mathematical statement. But then there's another thing that we, we or some of us strongly believe, that quantum systems can, in principle, physically implement BQP. And, uh, and that's not a conjecture. That's just a physical statement. It, it's not even... Uh, possible to, to state it formally because we live in a finite world. What does it mean to implement asymptotically something? And this touches upon this question of what theoretical computer science tells us at all. I mean, why is it that theoretical computer science that handles asymptotic uh, um, statements tell us anything about this world? But taking this in, um, for granted, um, without asking too many questions, um, these two beliefs together tell us that quantum computation, if built, will violate uh, um, the extended church strength. And therefore, we need something to replace it. 
or maybe we don't, but there is something very natural that replaces this thesis. Um, and this is the quantum church Turing thesis. And the quantum church Turing thesis tells us that, uh, well, as you can guess, um, that all physically reasonable computational devices um, can be simulated with only polynomial overhead by a quantum Turing machine or by a quantum computer. So that sort of says that um, the quantum model that I defined is in some sense universal. But now the notion of universality, which before I showed you several computational models and they, are, they looked pretty different but not very different. They are, they're all universal, this uh, game of life and DNA computation. They're all, they're all based on similar uh, rules. Now the notion of universality in quantum computation or quantum systems is actually seems to be much, much wider and much more, much broader somehow. I don't really have a good explanation for this, but have a look. Um, here is a universal model for quantum computation which seems very different. It's based on knots and knot invariants like the Jones polynomial and from topology and topological quantum field theory. That's universal for quantum computation, an equivalent model. That's another model that's equivalent. It's, it's, a it's called measurement-based quantum computation. It's based on measuring what's called graph states that are set on special graphs. Um, that's another model, adiabatic computation, in which you have Hamiltonians. Adiabatically, uh, Hamiltonians are just um, the way physicists describe interactions in nature. You can think of them as, as exponential size Hermitian matrices. And they adiabatically change um, from one matrix to another, and by tracking the, the ground state, the lowest, eigen, the lowest energy state, of, uh, meaning the lowest eigenvalue state of these uh, matrices, you can actually simulate quantum computation. And so this model is also universal. And this model of Riemannian geometry, based on a completely different notion, is also universal. I won't explain it. And there's another model based on quantum walks, and there are other models. And all these modes, which seem to be, to, to be talking about completely different physical systems, are quantum universal. And this actually uh, gives, well, I should say, of course, uh, what do I mean by universal? Well, it means that they're all, they, they can be mapped one to another in efficient ways. So in some very deep sense, they, pos they, they exhibit the same information processing with the same type of information processing. And this is something that's new to physicists, or that the was new. I'm sorry? The reductions themselves The reductions are classical. Um, the reductions are classical, otherwise it won't, be, won't have meaning. Um, um, so this, this is something that's, that's fundamentally, I mean, this is, this is a new understanding in physics um, that you cannot really point at where its effect is, but you can see. You can see its effect, that, that people start playing between very different systems and understand various connections between them. And because, it's because somehow the connections become, uh, people start talking about them without really acknowledging this from an information, in, information perspective rather than from the physical behavior of different systems. Um, okay, so all of them are equivalent to the quantum circuit model and they're at their best, let's say, all these models are really quantum. And this is, again, a new understanding in physics. What does it mean to be really quantum? Um, EPR, the, the state that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen um, thought of as demonstrating quantum um, properties, is not really quantum from my point of view. It's quantum because it possesses quantum properties, but it's not ultimately quantum because it doesn't have the universal and the computational power of large quantum systems. It sort of doesn't go all the way. Um, <coughs> you can simulate, of course, many EPR pairs uh, efficiently by a classical computer. So this sort of gives an idea of what is, I mean, it gave a new, um, uh, a new understanding of what it means for a system to be truly quantum. Now you can have, of course, systems which are not truly quantum, and apparently I think most systems, or maybe all systems that we have encountered so far, are not truly quantum, um, not really quantum. But this is sort of something to, that, to aspire to, to compare things to. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the first concept. 
Um, the second concept is, uh, is tightly related, is the notion of reductions. Now again, reductions is something that people in physics and in natural sciences uh, have thought about, not in, from the point of view of reductions, but from the point of view of equivalence between different behaviors of different physical systems. For example, in, uh, <coughs> in statistical physics, uh, people talk about universality classes. Um, again, theoretical computer science gives a new take on that. Um, instead of talking about equivalence via various physical properties, here we're talking about equivalence via the computational length from the point of view of information processing. And so we see that in various places, and these connections allow new insights on, di on different physical systems. So, okay, the first thing is what I already said before, um, these connections between the different physical uh, or uh, different models for quantum computation, which are very, very different, and they also constitute connections between different physical systems, um, like adiabatic systems and like topological quantum field theory. Um, but these reductions that make these things equivalent did not necessarily work on really quantum systems. They can also work on highly noisy quantum systems, and in fact, this is what Feynman um, this was the original motivation of Feynman when he uh, talked about quantum computers to simulate quantum, real quantum systems, not fully quantum, but any quantum system um, may be very noisy. And uh, Sirac and Zoller, uh, who won the Wolf Prize uh, uh, a few years back, uh, they actually pushed this idea much further, talking about the need to simulate noisy quantum systems using noisy controllable quantum systems, highly noisy quantum computers. And this is one of the main um, goals or main uh, um, ch uh, targets that people set for um, this, this era of quantum computation where the noise is way too high to actually get to, to computing these algorithms that I talked about before. Um, so this is the notion of quantum simulations between uh, highly noisy quantum systems. Now. Um, we can take this further, this notion of reduction, as this was done in theoretical computer science in the classical world. Um, so in classical world, reductions were uh, very extensively used, are very extensively used, in the notion, in the context of NP. And so, um, well, let's look at the major computer science problem of constraint satisfaction, where we want to, to, we want to satisfy a certain set of local constraint, and say we want to minimize the number of violations of this formula. Um, it turns out that, and of course there are thousands of NP complete problems with reductions between this problem and them, uh, and this gives, of course, a full picture of the complexity in classical, in classical computational complexity. This picture can be mapped to the quantum world as well, can be generalized to the quantum world, and it was generalized by Kitaev already in 98, and Kitaev noticed a very interesting uh, observation. He noticed that, um, well, he actually uh, wanted to, uh, um, to generate some, actually, he wanted to generate a result for Avi Vigdelson, by the way. He, we invited him to Israel uh, for a visit, and he didn't have anything to talk to theoretical computer scientists. So two days before his visit, he, he asked, uh, what can I talk about? Let's find um, a quantum analog to NP. And after two days, he gave the talk about this quantum NP at the Hebrew University. Um, so uh, what did he find? He found that this major problem in theoretical computer science is simply a special case of, uh, of the major problem in physics. What's the major problem in physics? You're given a set of interactions, local interactions, and you want to know um, uh, the ground energy or the ground state and how the low energy states behave. So this is uh, what's called a Hamiltonian, as I said before, and it should be thought of as some operator acting on n quantum particles, so it's a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix. How are these connected? CMP. I'm sorry, and CMP is condensed matter physics. Yes. Condensed matter physics. Condensed matter physics. Um, and how are these connected? Well, you should imagine these particles, uh, these variables as particles, spins, that can take plus or minus uh, values. And now imagine these constraints as, uh, as given by some quant or by classical interactions that penalize by some en amount of energy if the, if the value of these 
uh, particles, of the spins of these particles, is not something, is not in some forbidden set. So you can think of this as, of these constraints as, as giving energy penalties to various subsets of the, of the, of the evaluations of the, of the variables. And, well, if you now think of these constraints, of these particles as quantum particles, and these local constraints would be forbidding not classical evaluations, classical assignments to the spins, but quantum states, and assigning energy to quantum states, then you get what is simply a special case of quantum Hamiltonians. Um, and so you can actually view the, this problem as, as a Hamiltonian problem of finding the minimal energy. And you can actually generalize this to general local Hamiltonians. Um, and the thing you get as a present is multiparted entanglement in the quantum state, in the quantum ground state, which makes everything much more complicated, of course. Uh, but, but you also get as a present the questions coming from theoretical computer science, sorry, um, uh, coming from theoretical computer science about the, the connections between these, uh, these different problems of, uh, of the various uh, NP-hard problems. You can also take these tools and map them to tools asking questions about connections between different Hamiltonians. And this, since then, there has been a surge of, of uh, like a huge body of work trying to make these connections between different physical systems and trying to understand which physical systems are quantum and be hard and which are not. And, and these, this makes sort of a roadmap of Hamiltonians. When are these Hamiltonians hard? When are they easy? Um, uh, and makes connections between different physical systems, again, not from the point of view of how the dynamics work, but from the point of view of how hard it is to, to, talk, to find ground states. Um, <coughs> okay, so, so, um, so this again gives us sort of uh, uh, means to connect very different things using the, the computational lens. Okay, um, third concept, next to last, um, robustness. Robustness and stability. Robustness and stability is uh, our concepts again that physical that the, the physicists and natural scientists have a lot to say about in terms of perturbation theory and in terms of many many things. Um, and again, computer science has new things to say about it. So let's see. Um, okay, I think that the most surprising th thing for physicists was the discovery that quantum systems can be made uh, can be protected from noise meaning quantum error correcting codes um, that mimic classical error correcting codes um, into the quantum world. And I think the reason, again, the reason that, that this came up uh, and that this tells the physicist something is because now we can talk about quantum information being protected and not the quantum state being protected. The quantum, we cannot protect the quantum state the quantum state will be very, very noisy, even if we use quantum error correction. But the quantum information, the encoded information inside it, will be protected. And so uh, this idea that of information uh, um, is, is very surprising to physicists, or was very surprising to physicists. And the thing that I, I uh, pictured here is uh, the famous uh, Kitaev toric code, toric quantum error correcting code, which demonstrates the beauty of the, of the constructions related to, to protecting quantum states. Um, so what we have here, imagine a qubit set on each edge here in the torus. And it turns out that using local constraints on this torus, um, the ground states of, of the system will have topological properties, meaning that if you have, if you have an error going, say, the bits are flipped along this loop, and this loop is simply connected, meaning it can be, uh, um, how do you say that? Uh, contracted to, to zero, to nothing, then this doesn't affect at all the state. But if, if the error wraps around the torus in a topologically non-trivial way, then the state is logically changed, the information logically changes. And so uh, the state is actually encoded in the topological property of the system. And okay, so, so this is, these quantum error correcting codes seem to be designed mainly for quantum computation. But again, physicists, once they understood it, 
uh, it's a very interesting concept. Let's see what, well, how can we use it in other contexts, more physics-y contexts. So um, a very interesting uh, development and idea is that we can actually think of making measurements more precise using these quantum error correcting codes. So suppose we want to measure some system, but the signal decays. And we cannot measure for a long time, meaning the precision is very limited. The idea is that you can actually correct the, the system itself using a very simple quantum error correcting code and correct the signal as we measure it and thereby uh, increase the precision of the measurement. Um, and you don't need a full quantum computer for that. It's just a very small thing that improves your precision. Um, another very interesting uh, place where quantum error correcting codes appear, again, not in the context of quantum computation, is quantum gravity, a major problem in physics to connect quantum mechanics with uh, general relativity. Um, and uh, uh, people are, uh, are, were somewhat excited, I don't know how they feel now about it, um, uh, about this idea that, uh, that, uh, um, that <coughs> The, the weird phenomena that you get when you try to do it possibly can be explained by saying that the actual states in uh, space-time um, are states from quantum error correcting codes. So uh, the properties of quantum error correcting codes, which are highly entangled, globally entangled, could explain some of, of the uh, fascinating um, holography principle, for example. Uh, but I won't get into it, of course. Um, okay, one last point about this, about this robustness issue is, um, I think a very interesting question is, uh, is how, this robust, how robustness affects computational complexity. And um, when, we have, when we have systems like Hamiltonian systems performing computation, we can try to implement quantum error correction for them, but uh, we can also ask how fine-tuned they need to be, and, and whether the computational complexity depends on them being very fine-tuned, or is it stable? And so the computational complexity of stable systems, uh, I think, is, uh, is widely open. Okay, I'll leave this for maybe conversations uh, uh, later in the break. Um, okay, last, last uh, concept, um, interaction. So, um, okay, this is my, my favorite one. Um, what does it mean, uh, how, what do I mean by interaction? Uh, well, okay, let's start di diving into this uh, directly. Here is my uh, picture of what a physical experiment is. Um, it's naive. Okay, we have a physical theory, some physical theory, and we want to test it. There is the experimental side and there is the theoretical side. And Experimentalists just initialize the system with some initial condition, let it run, and measure. The theoretician computes the result based on the theory from the initial conditions and tells the prediction. And then you compare the two. And I call this the predicted, predict and compare paradigm. Okay? And you can think of, the, essentially this describes physical experiments. Um, when you now take seriously what we, what we in theoretical computer science say, that experiment, that everything should be efficient, um, every computation that we do should be efficient, one of the sides cannot be done in the world when we want to test quantum systems. Which side? This side, the, the left side. I hope this is not a prediction for the end of this day. Um, it's uh, um, this side cannot be uh, performed when we have uh, when we have um, polynomial computations because we cannot predict the the outcomes of uh, of quantum systems. Um, so so this is this leads to a mind-boggling observation that we cannot test the quantum universal the the truly quantum regime using the usual prediction compare paradigm. And, uh, and the fact that we cannot do that is really leads to, to a problem in our understanding of what can or we cannot test in quantum systems, okay? If we cannot, if we cannot compare, we cannot predict the results and compare, there's a problem. Um, so what's the problem? Well, 
Is quantum mechanics in the high-complexity regime even falsifiable? Can we test it? Was it tested? Do we know that quantum mechanics in the high-complexity regime is correct? Um, experimentally, how do we test experimentally that our systems really perform what they should do um, when we claim that they perform certain quantum computations that are not uh, easy to verify? Um, and cryptographically, uh, how can we safely delegate computations to, to, to companies that claim to be doing various things, but we cannot test them? So uh, again, there is a very interesting take on this coming from theoretical computer scientists. Um, and I'm sure you know this story. How many know this story when you see this, uh, this picture? No. Wow, OK, very few. So OK, I'm a magician. I know how to count leaves in trees if you point me to a tree, OK? Um, do you believe me? Probably not. Uh, in the break, you point me to, you point for me on a tree. I'll tell you the number of leaves is 200,070. Um, OK, you want to verify what I'm saying. You can go and count the number of leaves, but uh, this, this will take you too long. So here is a way to, to verify what I'm saying much more efficiently. Um, uh, using randomness and interaction, what will you do? You'll pick a random number of leaves, tear it from the tree, uh, make sure I don't look, um, and then ask me again, what's the number of leaves in the tree? And if I'm consistent, you're happy. Uh, or maybe, I don't know. Uh, anyway, I, I'm happy. And, uh, and then, uh, if you do this many times, and I pass the test, um, that's great. Uh, you're very convinced, maybe not ultimately convinced, but you know that I know something about counting leaves and trees, even though you don't know. Okay, so this is a very important understanding in theoretical computer science, this and much more elaborate versions of this, called interactive proofs, um, originated by Goldmaster, Mikhail, and Rakov, in which <coughs> they realized that a weak, a computationally weak verifier can actually um, get convinced with, ex with arbitrarily uh, good um, uh, convict. I don't know, uh, arbitrarily almost, uh, almost get convinced uh, to arbitrarily good uh, quality uh, that a very hard claims that he cannot prove or she cannot prove to herself using interactions with an all-powerful prover but untrusted. Um, and the idea here is that you can take to physics is now instead of interacting with a quantum, with an all-powerful prover, interact with a quantum prover meaning with a quantum system, that you want to get convinced that it's doing what it should be doing, um, or that it's working according to the rules or to the, to the description that, it's, uh, that, that people claim that it's doing. Um, OK, so, uh, so this interaction with a quantum computer, or maybe with a weaker quantum system, can be, uh, can be shown to be sufficient to get convinced of the correctness of a universal quantum evolution. So you can actually use randomized interactions with the universal quantum computer to get convinced that the evolution is correct, even though we cannot simulate it. And this sort of opens the way to a new idea of interactive experiments. Um, interactive experiments being a structured way in which an experimentalist can, or we, can interact with a physical system um, in a clever way um, which would mimic, maybe, or which would create different mathematical approaches to, uh, to verify highly complex systems. And uh, it's a question whether we can actually uh, extend these results to biology or to learn physical systems which are less controllable uh, than universal systems, universal quantum systems. Okay, so, so let me uh, um, just wrap up with uh, some main challenges in quantum computation. There are many of them. So the first would be show that there's any, uh, any advantage in quantum mechanics, any computation advantage over, uh, over classical systems. Um, people are now working on finding practical quantum algorithms. Um, there's a big question, are noisy quantum devices useful or can they give advances highly noisy above the threshold for error correction? And uh, is the model of noise that we rely on for error correction, is it correct in large limits? Um, 
And then I want to state one question which people are, I think, not working enough on, and I think it's very, very interesting. Because of the connection to the many different mathematical models that I talked about, we only have a few quantum algorithms. Um, can we design more using the different connections to, to various mathematical objects, uh, like Markov chains, etc.? Okay, so these are questions about quantum computation. Of course, there's a wider question. What else can fundamental concepts from theoretical computer science teach us about the world around us beyond just for quantum physics? And then there is uh, an even wider and more important question of who will not pass or who will pass the election threshold. Um, thanks. Thank you very much. All very, really quick questions because we're different classical, if you look at the reduction between different classical models of computation, which we observed are all in polynomial time, they're actually all in low, very low degree polynomial. In fact, I didn't check it, but my recollection is they're all at most quadratic. Is the same thing happened between the different quantum computational models? First of all, about their all being quadratic, I think you can sort of contrive, in a contrived way, design things that are, will not be quadratic. But, uh, but still, they will be low degree polynomials. They're all very low degree. And all um, the natural model people have proposed, I mean, I, I can't swear to do quadratic, but, but I think yeah. that kind of comes up. Yes, you can probably come up with some artificial that will, will break it, but it's, it will be very difficult and very artificial to climb up to, to yeah. seven it's, degree and to the seven. In spirit, it's the same in the quantum world, but in practice, I mean, not in practice, in mathematical practice, it's, it seems to me more complicated. Uh, it's not so direct. That's part of the reason why, why what I was saying, um, I mean, why I said what I was saying, that, that the models are so different. Uh, they're really much more different than classical models are, uh, like the topological quantum field theory versus uh, quantum walks. Um, so I think you need to, to make more effort to, to show the connection. That, re, uh, that reflects in the complexity.